Hello everyone, my name is Temur Rahman. I teach at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. I'm the spokesperson of the band LAL and I'm the Secretary General of the Workers and Peasants Party. Nationalism is one of those ideas that dominates the globe. And yet it is one, uh, an extremely controversial idea. You may ask me why I think it is controversial given its hegemonic status in the world today. Along with the concept of democracy, there is no other concept that attracts as much attention or has as many followers as nationalism. Certainly everyone loves their society, everyone loves their own people, everyone loves their country. Why would that be in any way, shape or form controversial? It may surprise you to discover that although English people have lived for many, many centuries and French people have lived for many centuries and so people of different languages have lived for many, many centuries, yet the concept of nationalism itself was born only in the 18th century. It's a very modern and new concept. So let's try and understand how this concept developed. Well, when capitalism came into being, the way it came into being was that um, various communities began to trade with each other, began to integrate with each other, began to create a common market. You see, in the feudal system, as well as in the Asia, in Asia as well as in slave society, uh, villages were, uh, relatively speaking, self-sufficient. They didn't produce for a market. The manner of the fief was self-sufficient and so on. So, this was a very big change that came about in the 1600s and in the 1500s and so on, where villages began to produce not for, their, for, for themselves, villages began to produce not for themselves, but they began to produce in order to exchange. And when they began to exchange, naturally they began to exchange with those people who lived close to them and they began to exchange with those people who could understand their languages. You can't trade with people who can't understand your language. So a community was formed that had five basic characteristics. Number one, it was a stable community. They weren't nomads, they weren't pastoralists, so they weren't moving around. Because nomads and pastoralists may trade seasonally, but they don't trade on a regular basis. Secondly, they had to have some common territory because this you couldn't order online and just sort of expect something to arrive so they had to have some common territory they have to ha had to have a common language because they had to speak to each other and ask the price and haggle and bargain and so on and they be as they integrated they developed a common economy and of course they had a common culture these are the basic five characteristics that uh, that define a nation that brought together a community and made them into into a nation now, when nations came, came into being, and as they grew richer, when these communities, these market-driven communities became richer, they began to challenge the political power of the landed class. They did that in England and they did that in French. Because these communities had already been created and they were thinking about England for the English and France for the French and so on, these are some of the main slogans of nationalism. When they, when they finally overthrew the monarchies of their time, they created what we call nation states. Since they had already become nations, when they took over the state, the state represented the nation, they became nation states. But after the French Revolution, which is the classic bourgeois democratic revolution, and Napoleon's conquest over, uh, over Europe, the other European states that were still landed states, that were still based on feudalism, looked at France and looked at England and realized that they uh, had been left behind in the march of civilization. So they decided they needed to modernize their, their state and their, specifically their army. They began to develop manufacturing and industry to develop the arms and ammunition that would supply the army. But as they developed industry, naturally, they began to develop capitalism. So capitalism on the con on most of the, in, 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 in most of Europe came not from below, didn't develop from below, from villages and so on, but developed rather from the top. It was the feudal class itself that introduced capitalist production into those societies. So that's the basic difference between England and France and let's say Germany. In England and France, capitalism developed from below and then emerged, whereas in <coughs> Prussia and Germany, capitalism developed from above and then it seeped into life. Now these big states, certainly states like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these were multilingual states. As capitalism began to develop uh, in, uh, and began to spread from the top down, the people of these states began to awaken to national life. They began to talk about themselves as a nation. They began to, they became nations, but they suddenly found that they were in states that did not accord to their, to the boundaries of, of their, of their uh, various nation, national groups. So they began to compete with each other. And that's basically uh, one of the big reasons that led to World War I. But that's something that I'll discuss in another, uh, in another lecture. Now, 
the third major transition that occurred was that these European states, Germany included, began to conquer other parts of Africa. They began to conquer, of course, Spain and Portugal conquered Latin America. Um, uh, you know, Britain conquered India. Uh, France conquered North Africa. Now, as they conquered the third world, they, they created gigantic colonial states. And these, the, the boundaries of these colonial states also did not accord to linguistic boundaries. They accorded to boundaries where two colonial powers met and drew up a boundary. That was it. It was on the basis of conquest. That's why most of the th states that you see in the third world um, have people of various languages within one state and many people of one language are have a boundary, an international boundary running right between their territory. So, for example, there are many Pashtuns who live in Afghanistan and there are many Pashtuns in Pakistan. There are many Baloch who live in, in Iran and then there are many Baloch who live in Pakistan. And similarly, there are many Punjabis who live in um, India and there are many Punjabis who live in what is today Pakistan. And this is the case all over the world, more or less. It's the case also in Africa. It's the case more or less uh, in, in all of Asia. Now, the, one of the central characteristics of capitalism is that capitalism always develops unevenly. Whoever makes a little more money is able to make even more money. And the, the, the difference between the, the inequality between the rich and the poor continues to grow. Not only does the inequality between the rich and the poor continue to grow, uh, the inequality between classes grows. Now, individuals may jump between classes, but uh, in aggregate terms, the inequality always grows. Uh, the inequality between states and nations also grows. When a nation develops, uh, capitalist develop, when it when it uh, when it goes down the path of capitalist development, becomes a little more advanced, it is then able to use that advanced technology to exploit the labor power and the raw materials of those nations that are not as economically advanced. And that's basically what gives rise to or gave rise to the system that we call colonialism or the system that we call imperialism. So what we see, therefore, when we see uh, uh, that capitalism develops is that the uneven spas spasmodic development of capitalism leads also to the contradiction between not only classes, but also contradiction between uh, people of different uh, races and people of different nations and so on. And if you add to that the fact that people who uh, nations that develop a privileged position or a position of dominance don't want to share their wealth and their uh, riches with backward nations or economically backward nations, what you get is a situation where uh, these economically dominant nations will try to shut out the other nations from participation in politics or in their state. They will undertake undemocratic uh, measures to keep those people um, away from the corridors of power. So this results in a policy of national oppression. One of the classic examples, of course, of national oppression is how uh, uh, is slavery in the United States South or is are the apartheid laws in uh, uh, South Africa or in uh, Rhodesia, what is now Zimbabwe and so on. And there are many, many other examples that one can find uh, in colonial history. So this results in dividing or bifurcating nations between those that are oppressed nations and those that are oppressor nations, leading to national conflict. In the 21st century, we've seen has really been dominated on the one hand with the struggle between socialism and capitalism, which is a class struggle. But on the other hand, in the competition between various nations and the struggle and the conflict between various nations, nationalism, uh, capitalism, in, because of its uneven development, automatically generates uh, nationalism all over the world because it brings people into conflict and contradiction with each other. Hope you enjoyed that lecture. I'll talk more about nationalism in the next one. But before le departing, I want to say that um, all the doctrines of the left, socialism included, want to organize the oppressed, the poor, the downtrodden, uh, into uh, into a political identity. So Marx says, workers of the world unite. So that's a that's a horizontal sort of solidarity, whereas nationalism argues for a vertical solidarity. And that's why they often contradict each other, because nationalists will say, well, you're French, I'm French. Why should you support British workers or their strike? You should support French capitalists. I'm German, you're German. Why should you support the Russian working class? You should support the German capitalist class. And we will work together because as a German, I understand your problems. The Russian workers don't understand your problems. And of course, barriers of language do play a very important role in creating misunderstandings and miscommunication and so on and so forth. So nationalism can be a very powerful doctrine for that very reason. But this is the reason why when Marx sort of 
elaborated this analysis, people reproached him and said, oh, you want to do away with countries? You want to do away with nationalities? And that's when Marx famously replied, oh, the working men have no country. We cannot take away from them that which we haven't got. I'll speak more about that in the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed this one.